What do the Great Pyramid, a golden rectangle, the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, the Five Platonic Solids, Stonehenge, the Rhythm of Venus, a hexagram, a heptagon, and witchcraft have in common? Our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. The best place to hide a secret is in the open, where no one will see. What you're about to see in this first time, one of a kind, documentary entitled D.C. Street Sorcery is the revealing of hidden occult knowledge and the exposure of the conspirator of all conspirators, all with a tie-in to Bible prophecy, a Bible prophecy that is being fulfilled at the very release and the viewing of this documentary. That prophecy was made by Jesus Christ. It's found in Mark 4.22. For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret, but that it should come to light. There is another prophecy in the Bible concerning eyes that could not and would not see and ears that could not and would not hear. A prophecy stating that someday those eyes would see and those ears would hear. That day would be when a certain land and certain cities were devastated. The prophecy is found in Isaiah chapter 6. Now this documentary comes at a time when our once free and great nation has been enslaved and devastated. It's actually a repeat of history, our history. For it was our forefathers who were enslaved in Egypt of old. Now that small minority of they in Pharaoh's day had at their disposal a power. How else were they able to, as a minority, to enslave the majority? We are told in that conspiratorial story, in the book of Exodus, chapter 7, what Pharaoh and his cronies had at their disposal. It says in verse 11, Then Pharaoh also called for the wise men and the sorcerers, and they also the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts. We see in this story that Pharaoh had at his disposal magicians. It's interesting to note that that word magicians means, from the Strong's Concordance, quote, a horoscopist as drawing magical lines or circles, end quote. You are going to see in this documentary the drawing of lines and circles emanating out from Washington, D.C., put there by magicians. A prayer that best be prayed before viewing further in this documentary is a prayer to be delivered from evil. For you will no doubt sense and feel the emanation of evil in this D.C. Street Sorcery documentary as these hidden occult things are revealed. It's nothing to fear, but it's certainly something to reckon with. And when one prays, deliver us from evil, it takes care of that. And that's why we suggest the prayer of being delivered from evil. And there's no better prayer on that than the Lord's Prayer. And so we suggest you pray it as you continue to view this documentary. The Lord's Prayer says, and we read it from the Bible, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lastly and very briefly, in this documentary, you will also be given information concerning strongholds. The Bible not only speaks of magic and sorcery and spell casting, but of strongholds. And this nation is held right now in a stronghold. But there is a way it can be broken. 
By watching this documentary, you'll come to understand that stronghold, prophecy concerning the stronghold, and you might be, if you go to the last two chapters of this documentary, part of that remnant that break that stronghold. Well, the Bible talks about sorcery, magic, spellcasting, and strongholds. And in the very last chapter, we will give you information, just information for a special remnant for the breaking of those strongholds. The magic, the sorcery, the spellcasting, the strongholds will be broken. Section 1, the Octahedron. This is Washington, D.C., capital city of the United States of America. Using a map of Washington, we will outline the Platonic Solids, the Great Pyramid of Giza, the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, a Golden Rectangle, and more symbols of sacred geometry using the layout of Washington. The basis for creating these symbols is basic geometry, which teaches that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. We will be using several reference points on the map. The first reference point is Observatory Circle, colored in blue. Observatory Circle is the home of Vice President Joe Biden in the Naval Observatory. Observatory Circle represents the moon on our map. The connection between Observatory Circle and the moon is their diameters. Observatory Circle is 2,160 feet across. The moon's diameter is 2,160 miles across. Coincidence? Our next reference point, colored in orange, is our solar symbol, made by Columbus Circle, Union Station. The streets of Columbus Circle make the sun's rays. They are Massachusetts Avenue, F Street, E Street, Louisiana Avenue, Delaware Avenue, First Street, and Massachusetts Avenue again. Meridian Hill Park, colored in green, off 16th Street, will be our next reference point. 16th Street is the meridian line of most of the sacred geometry you will see in this video. You can see in our map of Washington, D.C. that the White House the U.S. Capitol, the Jefferson Memorial, and the Lincoln Memorial are all colored in blue for easy reference. The first symbol we will be looking at is one of the five platonic solids, the octahedron, which is the symbol for air. Platonic solids are fundamental in the creation of the world we live in because all creation can be distilled down to these geometric shapes. The platonic solids are named after Plato, the philosopher who discovered them. Here, on a map of Washington, D.C., you see the octahedron shaded in yellow and outlined in black. What you are seeing is a three-dimensional skeletal shape of an octahedron on a two-dimensional plane, our map of Washington. Remember, geometry teaches that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. The points of the octahedron are 1, the White House, 2, Logan Circle, 3, the apex of the octahedron, 16th and U Street, 4, DuPont Circle, 5, Scott Circle, and finally back to the White House. The octahedron on the map is superimposed on a satellite image of Washington, D.C. for clarity. you see the resemblance? Those behind the DC street sorcery are using the octahedron, outlined in yellow, as one of the many links between the physical world and the spiritual world. The octahedron is similar to the yin-yang symbol in that it represents the union of opposites. In the occult world, the bringing together of all opposites is the highest attainable goal that sorcery wants to achieve. As an example of the union of opposites, overall creation is one world government, the new world order.
Section 2, Tetrahedron. The next platonic solid and symbol made by the layout of the streets of Washington, D.C. is the tetrahedron, the symbol of fire. Does this symbol look familiar? It's Sitco Gas Station's logo. On the map, the points that make up the tetrahedron are Washington Circle, Mount Vernon Square, and the apex, U.N. 16th Street. The connecting streets are K Street, New Hampshire Avenue, a line between U.N. 16th Street, and Mount Vernon Square. The center of the tetrahedron is Scott Circle. Scott Circle connects to the apex by 16th Street. Scott Circle connects to Washington Circle by Rhode Island Avenue. And it connects to Mount Vernon Square by Massachusetts Avenue. You can see in our map, the colors that make up our tetrahedron are red at the bottom, orange to the left, and a darker orange to the right. Again, for clarity, the tetrahedron is overlaid on a satellite image of Washington, D.C. Do you see the resemblance? The tetrahedron was considered by Pythagoras, a Greek philosopher in the third century B.C., to be the fire that ignites creative energies. Pythagoras, studying under the wise men, magicians of ancient Egypt, and may have drawn his knowledge about the tetrahedron from them. Those behind the D.C. street sorcery are using the tetrahedron to empower their will upon the physical plane you. They are doing this by manipulating the element of fire, represented by the tetrahedron within America's capital. All of these platonic solids are represented in our nation's capital as a symbol of concentration, so those behind the D.C. street sorcery can manifest their will upon the rest of the nation. By focusing their energies in the capital through the symbols made by the layouts of the streets, in essence, those behind the D.C. street sorcery are at the steering wheel of our nation, and through their sorcery are creating havoc within this nation and the greater world. Below the tetrahedron, made by the White House, the Jefferson Memorial, the U.S. Capitol, and the Lincoln Memorial, is a cross. The center of the cross where the lines intersect is the Jefferson Pier Stone. The Jefferson Pier Stone corresponds to the Kabbalistic point Yassad, which will be shown later. In the 1901-1902 Macmillan Commission plan for the mall in Washington, D.C., you see the same cross inside a seven-sided casket made by the streets that are surrounding the cross using the aforementioned monuments as the connecting points. Does this symbol represent the death of Christianity? Section 3, Akazahedron. This is an Akazahedron. The Akazahedron is another of the platonic solids. It represents the element of water, which is an opposite element of the tetrahedron, fire. Again, the union of opposites is being represented by the element of water, the Akazahedron, and the element of fire, the tetrahedron. Looking at the map, shaded in orange, is 1 20th of an Akazahedron made by the layout in Washington. The points for the Akazahedron are Mount Vernon Square, Washington Circle, and the Jefferson Memorial. The White House is at the center of the Akazahedron and is connected by the diameter lines New York Avenue and Pennsylvania Avenue. Again, for clarity, 1 20th of an Akazahedron is overlaid on a satellite image of Washington, D.C. Do you see the resemblance? As with other platonic solids we have discussed, the Akazahedron is another symbol used by those behind the D.C. street sorcery as a vehicle of concentration in order to manipulate or manifest their will upon the physical plane, you. On top of the Akazahedron, shaded in yellow, is a double square divided by 16th Street with four triangular areas in pink. These symbols represent the square root of five. The square root of five is the proportion that opens the family of relationships, which is called golden proportions. The golden proportion is the key to the link between the world of matter and the world of spirit. The center of the symbol to the right is Logan Circle. 
The square is made up of K Street, 7th Street, U Street, and 16th Street. The center horizontal line going through Logan Circle is P Street. The center vertical line going through Logan Circle is 13th Street. This symbol opens the door to the golden ratio or phi, 1.618, which Plato had said is the key to understanding the physics of the universe and creation. This ratio phi, 1.618, is expressed again and again in our nation's capital. Section 4, Heptagon The heptagon is a seven-pointed star. It is not a platonic solid. The heptagon was used by Dr. John Dee, the 16th century mathematician, occultist, Satanist, and master spy to Queen Elizabeth I. Dr. Dee created a seal, Seelium Dei, which he used in his seances to conjure demons and gain knowledge. This seal, Seelium Dei, that Dr. D used was in the shape of a heptagon. A heptagon is also used in occult rituals today. A member of the occult group, OTO, which stands for Ordo Templi Orientis, Steffi Grant, used the heptagon in an occult painting, Vault of the Adepts. The Satanist, Aleister Crowley, also used a heptagon in his occult ceremonies and ritual practices. In our nation's capital, a heptagon is made by the layout of the monuments and streets. For clarity, shaded in pink, the points that form the heptagon are 1. Logan Circle 2. DuPont Circle 3. Washington Circle 4. The Lincoln Memorial 5. The Jefferson Memorial 6. The Hirshhorn Sculpture Garden and 7. Mount Vernon Square Again, for clarity, the heptagon is overlaid on a satellite image of Washington, D.C. Do you see the resemblance? A heptagon is also shown in a sculpture, Moondog, by Tony Smith, that exists in the National Gallery Sculpture Garden on Madison and 7th Street. Each point, circle, monument of the heptagon correlates to one of the seven planets known to ancient man and were considered physical manifestations of celestial intelligences. These planets are the Sun, Jefferson Memorial, Mars, Lincoln Memorial, Jupiter, Washington Circle, Saturn, DuPont Circle, the Moon, Logan Circle, Mercury, Mount Vernon Square, and Venus, the Hirshhorn Sculpture Gallery. As evidence of this correspondence between the points of the heptagon and the seven planets. At DuPont Circle is a female figure holding a globe with a ring around the globe. The globe she is holding is Saturn. Also you can see on the female figure are a five-pointed star and a six-pointed star. As another piece of evidence, the Jefferson Memorial corresponds with one of the seven planets known to ancient man, the Sun. The Jefferson Memorial also lines with the summer solstice line via Maryland Avenue. This photo of the summer solstice was taken on June 20th, 2008. You can see the sun rising over National Arboretum via Maryland Avenue. If you had a clear view from the Jefferson Memorial to the Capitol Dome, you could see the sun rise over the Capitol Dome similar to what the Druids saw when the sun rose over the heelstone at Stonehenge. In National Arboretum, a sacred grove that the Bible speaks of, are the 22 capital columns. These 22 columns mark the importance of Maryland Avenue as the summer solstice line, evidenced by a stone in the ground inscribed with the words, the illumination of the columns is a gift of Judith and Gerson Lieber. These 22 capital columns also correspond with the 22 major arcana of the tarot deck and the 22 paths of the Kabbalistic tree of life. Within the heptagon is also a five-pointed star called a pentagram and a six-pointed star called a hexagram.
The points of the pentagram are one, the White House, two, Mount Vernon Square, three, Washington Circle, four, Logan Circle, and five, DuPont Circle. The pentagram is also known as a symbol of Venus because of the pattern Venus traces around the Earth in its eight-year cycle. Man's body also forms a pentagram. To the right of the circle is the hieroglyphic form for Venus. The pentagram is used in Masonic temples. The pentagram in its hieroglyphic form is equivalent to the constellation Virgo and the Egyptian goddess of wisdom, Isis. In ritual magic, the pentagram is used to evoke and banish spirits. The points of the hexagram, the next symbol, are 1. Logan Circle, 2. DuPont Circle, 3. Washington Circle, 4. Mount Vernon Square, 5. Freedom Plaza, and 6. Rawlings Park. The hexagram is also used in ritual magic for evoking and banishing of spirits. You've probably seen the hexagram before. It's on the Israeli flag. It's also known as the Star of David. Section 5, The Kabbalistic Tree of Life. For clarity to the viewer, there are variant spellings of Kabbalah. The next symbol that exists within the layout of Washington, D.C. is the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. The Kabbalistic Tree of Life is found in the book the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Creation. The Kabbalistic Tree of Life is made by three pillars, ten worlds, and twenty-two paths. The three pillars are connected to each other and the ten worlds by the twenty-two paths. The pillars are 1. A pillar of severity, 2. A pillar of mercy, and 3. A pillar of mildness. The ten worlds are 1. Crown, 2. Wisdom, 3. Understanding, 4. Mercy, 5. Severity, 6. Beauty, 7. Victory, 8. Glory, 9, Foundation, 10, Kingdom, and an optional World 11, Knowledge. The Kabbalistic Tree of Life has been used by the Kabbalistic rabbis for the last six or seven centuries. The Kabbalistic Tree of Life, a diagrammatic view of the processes of the human mind, and explains the way in which the will, by the power of the mind, can manifest on the spiritual as well as the physical plane, as a way of creating change in the physical world that we live in. In essence, the philosophy, the Sefer Yetzirah, Book of Creation, symbolized by the Tree of Life, is the same philosophy of George Friedrich Hegel. Thesis, Pillar of Severity. Antithesis, Pillar of Mercy. Synthesis, Pillar of Mildness. What does this mean in layman's terms? You create a problem, our economy, thesis, pillar of severity. You give a solution to the problem, borrow money from the banking system, antithesis, pillar of mercy. And then our money elite make all the money and you are left with nothing, synthesis, pillar of mildness. The points of the Kabbalistic tree of life within the layout of Washington are 1. You and 16th Street. Kabbalistic Point Crown, 2. Logan Circle, Kabbalistic Point Wisdom, 3. DuPont Circle, Kabbalistic Point Understanding, 4. 13th Street and New York Avenue, Kabbalistic Point Mercy, 5. 19th and Pennsylvania Avenue, Kabbalistic Point Severity, 6. The White House, Kabbalistic Point Beauty, 7. Freedom Plaza, Kabbalistic Point Victory, 8, Rawlings Park, Kabbalistic Point Glory, 9, Jefferson Pierstone, Kabbalistic Point Foundation, and if you remember, 
the Jefferson Pier stone was the center point in the cross mentioned in section 2. 10. The Jefferson Memorial, Kabbalistic Point, Kingdom. 11. An optional point, Scott Circle, Kabbalistic Point, Knowledge. The pillars that make up the Kabbalistic tree are 19th Street between DuPont Circle and E Street, Pillar of Severity, 13th Street between Logan Circle and Pennsylvania Avenue, Pillar of Mercy, 16th Street between U Street and the Jefferson Memorial. If you continue 16th Street past the White House down to the Jefferson Memorial, Pillar of Mildness, the middle pillar. For clarity, the Kabbalistic Tree of Life is overlaid on a satellite image of Washington, D.C. Do you see the resemblance? Section 6, The Great Pyramid Within the layout of our nation's capital is a pyramid, and not just any pyramid, but the pyramid, the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. The pyramid starts using the straight segment of Independence Avenue and First Street where the Cannon House office building is. Take Independence Avenue straight from First Street and we stop at Arlington National Cemetery. Going back to First Street and Independence Avenue, Using the Capitol Dome, Mount Vernon Square, Logan Circle, and the apex of our Great Pyramid, U and 16th Street, we have just connected one face of the Great Pyramid in our nation's capital. Remember, geometry teaches that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Starting at the apex of the Great Pyramid, U and 16th Street, the other face is partially drawn for us, New Hampshire Avenue. The connecting points on New Hampshire Avenue are DuPont Circle, Washington Circle, and ending at Arlington National Cemetery where it intersects with the base of our pyramid from Independence Avenue and First Street. Again, for clarity, the Great Pyramid is overlaid on a satellite image of our nation's capital. Do you see the resemblance? The passage system within the Great Pyramid at Giza is also laid out in the streets in Washington. The descending passage is Maryland Avenue, starting at the U.S. Capitol and ending at the Jefferson Memorial, which corresponds with the subterranean chamber at the Great Pyramid at Giza. The ascending passage within the Great Pyramid in Washington would be Pennsylvania Avenue, ending at Freedom Plaza. The Queen's Chamber passage is Constitution Avenue. The area between Pennsylvania Avenue, the ascending passage, and Constitution Avenue, the Queen's Chamber passage, is Federal Triangle. Federal Triangle in Washington corresponds to the triangular area between the Ascending Passage and the Queen's Chamber Passage in the Great Pyramid at Giza. The ceiling and the relieving stones above the King's Chamber are made by I Street, K Street, L Street, the South Street, and M Street. The ceiling of the King's Chamber is made by Rhode Island Avenue between Connecticut Avenue and Scott Circle and Massachusetts Avenue between Scott Circle and Thomas Circles. The sides of the relieving stones would be 17th Street, 15th Street, and the meridian of the pyramid in Washington is 16th Street, hence the name Meridian Hill Park. Within Washington's Great Pyramid is also a copy of the station stone rectangle that exists at Stonehenge. The perimeter for the station stone rectangle is K Street, between Washington Circle and 13th Street, 13th Street between K Street and Logan Circle, P Street between Logan Circle and 23rd Street, and 23rd Street between P Street and Washington Circle. These streets give us the perimeter of our station stone rectangle in Washington. The two station stone rectangles that are still standing at Stonehenge are Station Stone 91 and Station Stone 93. Station Stone 91 at Stonehenge would correspond to Logan Circle in Washington. Station Stone 93 at Stonehenge corresponds to Washington Circle. Rhode Island Avenue between Washington Circle and Logan Circle is the hypotenuse. Rhode Island Avenue corresponds to the summer and winter moonrise. 
The perimeter of the station stone rectangle at Stonehenge equals the length of one side of the Great Pyramid at Giza in Egypt. The perimeter of the station stone rectangle made by the streets in Washington equals the length of a Great Pyramid in Washington. The Nile in Egypt branches to the left and to the right, so does the Potomac River branch to the left and to the right, as if we are still living in Egyptian bondage today. Section 7. Golden Rectangle Creation is growth by division, and no mathematical formula more clearly demonstrates this truth than a golden rectangle. And a golden rectangle exists within the street patterns of our nation's capital. The streets that make the perimeter are 1st Street between Independence Avenue and P Street, P Street between 1st Street and Potomac Street in Georgetown, Potomac Street between P Street and Independence Avenue, Independence Avenue between Potomac Street and 1st Street with the eye of the golden rectangle being Washington Circle. The streets existing within the perimeter of the golden rectangle in Washington that create the internal lines of the golden rectangle are 1. Pennsylvania Avenue between the U.S. Capitol and Potomac Street in Georgetown via Washington Circle. 2. A line starting at Independence Avenue and 1st Street via the U.S. Capitol to Logan Circle. 3. 19th Street between DuPont Circle and Independence Avenue. 4. New Hampshire Avenue between DuPont Circle and Arlington National Cemetery. 5. I Street between Pennsylvania Avenue and the perimeter line Potomac Street in Georgetown. 6. 25th Street between New Hampshire Avenue and P Street. 7. 23rd Street between I Street and L Street. 8. L Street between 25th Street and 19th Street and 9, K Street between 25th Street and 19th Street. Can you see the resemblance? Ken McGrath, author of the book The Secret Geometry of the 1935 Dollar, documented the design of the 1935 dollar by Edward Mitchell Weeks. Weeks was the superintendent of printing and engraving under Franklin Delano Roosevelt's administration. It was FDR who approved Weeks' design of the reverse of the 1935 dollar. Documented in Ken McGrath's book is his discovery of the use of the golden rectangle that Weeks designed in the dollar bill. This is the golden rectangle encoded in the dollar bill by Weeks. Here is the golden rectangle that exists in Washington, D.C. This is the dollar bill encoded with the golden rectangle and highlighted for clarity. This is our nation's capital. This is the highlighted $1 bill. Within our nation's capital in the $1 bill in your pocket is a golden rectangle. The golden rectangle in Washington, because of its dimensions based on fee, gives rise to a pyramid with the same angle of slope as the Great Pyramid in Egypt. Leonardo da Vinci and his friend Luca Pacioli attributed various mystical and supernatural properties to the golden rectangle. In October 2001, NASA began collecting data on cosmic background radiation with a Wilkinson microwave probe. Their harmonics generated by their probe reflect the shape of the object in which the waves generate. In the case of the NASA probe, the object that is being reflected is the universe itself. The study revealed that the universe is in the shape of a dodecahedron, which is one of the platonic solids and stands for ether, the energy of the universe. Geometry teaches within every dodecahedron is a golden rectangle. So a golden rectangle exists within the shape of the universe, a golden rectangle exists within the streets of our nation's capital, and a golden rectangle exists within the U.S. $1 bill. Why do all these golden rectangles exist? The law of similars. The golden rectangle within the dodecahedral shape of the universe acts as an energetic template from which the golden rectangle in Washington, D.C., and by extension, the golden rectangle encoded in the $1 bill draw energy from the greater in harmony with the lesser, and vice versa. The importance of the golden rectangle is demonstrated by the birthplace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Bethlehem. 
Bethlehem is positioned on our globe at a latitude of 31.68 degrees north, a position that forms a golden rectangle made by using the polar and equatorial diameters of the Earth. The key to this energetic template created by the golden rectangle is phi, 1.618, and like all the other secrets in Washington, D.C., phi is hidden in plain sight. Phi is encoded at the Eastern Star Lodge on New Hampshire Avenue. New Hampshire Avenue connects the Eastern Star Lodge to Washington Circle, the eye of the golden rectangle in our nation's capital. The address of the Eastern Star Lodge is 1618 New Hampshire Avenue, or Phi, 1.618. Coincidence? I don't think so. Section 8, the relationship between the acosahedron with the dodecahedron. The interplay between an acosahedron and a dodecahedron create an interesting figure. This figure is created by the crossing of all the eternal radiance of the acosahedron with a dodecahedron. Does the figure shaded in yellow look familiar? For clarity, the perimeter around the shaft near the top of the Washington Monument is outlined along with all external edges near the top of the Washington Monument, front and back. What you are seeing is a skeletal view of the top of the Washington Monument in three-dimensional form. What does this have to do with the layout of our nation's capital? Everything. The same three-dimensional figure, the interplay between the acosahedron and the dodecahedron, is created by using the monuments and streets in Washington, D.C. The points for this three-dimensional monument on a two-dimensional plane are 1. The Jefferson Memorial, 2. The Lincoln Memorial, 3. Washington Circle, 4. DuPont Circle, 5. The Apex UN 16th Street, 6. Logan Circle, 7. Mount Vernon Square, 8. Herschel and Sculpture Garden, 9. The White House, and 10. Scott Circle. The streets that are used to create this three-dimensional figure are 1. 23rd Street between the Lincoln Memorial and Washington Circle 2. New Hampshire Avenue between Washington Circle and U Street 3. A line between U Street and Mount Vernon Square 4. 8th Street between Mount Vernon Square and the Herschel and Sculpture Garden 5. Pennsylvania Avenue between Washington Circle and the White House Six. New York Avenue between the White House and Mount Vernon Square, 7. Massachusetts Avenue between Mount Vernon Square and Scott Circle, 8. Rhode Island Avenue between Scott Circle and Washington Circle, 9. 16th Street between U Street and the Jefferson Memorial, 10. A line between the Jefferson Memorial and the Herschel and Sculpture Garden, and 11. A line between the Jefferson Memorial and the Lincoln Memorial. This energetic template that exists in the layout of our nation's capital is connected via the Washington Monument to the becker Hagen's Planetary Grid. The grid gets its name from the husband and wife team that discovered it in 1983. The law of similars comes into play again, the greater in harmony with the lesser, the greater in harmony with the lesser and vice versa. The interplay of the acosahedron and the dodecahedron is also expressed in the layout of Washington by the acosahedral face, 1 20th of an acosahedron, and the dodecahedral face, 1 12th of a dodecahedron, the pentagon. The interplay of these platonic shapes taps into the resonant frequency of the planet, shown as an exoskeleton, that encompasses the Earth. Using solar, earth, and life force energies, this complex of symbols in our nation's capital manipulates the resonant frequency of the earth, and by extension, you. Section 9, Veshika Pisces. The Veshika Pisces is the archetypal expression of Tunis. 
It is another symbol that expresses growth by division in the layout of our nation's capital. The Vesica Pisces is formed by the overlapping of two circles in the center created by the overlapping circles is considered in sacred geometry to be the portal between the physical realm and the spiritual realm. Various churches and Masonic lodges throughout Washington, D.C. show the importance of the Vesica Pisces by its use as an icon. The dimensions and geometry of the Great Pyramid at Giza relate to the Vesica Pisces, as does the dimensions of the Pyramid in Washington relate to the Vesica Pisces. In the occult world, the Vesica Pisces represents the pineal gland found in the midbrain. The pineal gland is seen as the third eye and as a way of direct experience and communication with great spiritual beings. This diagram of a wormhole by the astrophysicist Carl Schwarzschild shows in its center the Vesica Pisces. In this aerial photo of the Washington Monument, you see the monument at the center of two overlapping circles, the Vesica Pisces. Due to time constraints, we won't go into the geometric construction of the Vesica Pisces, but we will leave you this drawing of the Vesica Pisces with axis lines highlighted for those who would like the challenge of constructing the Vesica Pisces on a map of Washington, D.C. The most powerful room in our nation, the Oval Office, is a less pointed version of the Vesica Pisces. The shape of the Oval Office amplifies the biophysical energies of the human body, so these energies climb ever higher via the ladder of geometric progression in the shape of the Vesica Pisces. The Vesica Pisces is part of a greater whole, and that greater whole is the flower of life a geometric construction of many overlapping circles from which all the platonic solids can be constructed. The flower of life is another pattern created by the electromagnetic radiation of the Earth. We see on our map of Washington, D.C., the relationship between the flower of life and the image on our map from Section 8. In Washington, D.C., a museum of South American art, the Art Museum of the Americas, has in its back courtyard a statue of the Aztec deity Hosimil. This statue marks the center of the 10 mile square layout of Washington, D.C. Hosimil is known as the Prince of Flowers. It is from this statue that the flower of life begins. Section 10, in the middle of the line where M cuts the lesser line. A treasure, not of gold, not of knowledge, a treasure worth far more than both. A treasure that goes back to the time of Christ and is with us today. A treasure whose clues are spread throughout the city of Washington, D.C. in paintings, in street names, in the history of Washington, and the history of other regions of the world. The first clue to be used to find this treasure comes from the vicinity of Rennes-le-Chateau in France. It is the calm sword stone found in 1967. Notice the spear point. If we apply the shape to our nation's capital, it resembles the shape made by 1. Kentucky Avenue between Lincoln Park and Barney Circle, 2. Tennessee Avenue between Lincoln Park and Maryland Avenue, 3. Pennsylvania Avenue between the Capitol Dome and Barney Circle, and four, Maryland Avenue between the Capitol Dome and where it intersects with Tennessee Avenue. Do you see the resemblance between the Comsword Stone and the streets within our nation's capital? Our next clue as to what the treasure is, is in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. The clue is hidden in the painting Sacrament of the Last Supper by Salvador Dali. The painting is in the golden rectangle proportion. The painting's length is 105 inches, divided by its width, 65 inches, equals 1.615 inch, which is very close to the golden proportion of phi, 1.618. Dali's painting, by using the dimensions of a golden rectangle, forms a pyramid with the apex of the pyramid resting on the Adam's apple 
of the floating figure. The painting shows Jesus Christ with the twelve apostles. Who is the figure floating above Christ? Revelation by omission. Our next clue is the word Potomac, as in Potomac River and Potomac Street in Georgetown. If you remember, it was one of the perimeter lines that creates the golden rectangle we covered in Section 7. In the Algonquin language, the universal language of the eastern seaboard Indian tribes, the word Potomac means something brought or the place where something is brought. East Capitol Street is the line of demarcation between the lettered streets in northeast Washington and the lettered streets in southeast Washington. You have a North A Street and a South A Street. There is no North B Street or South B Street. Then you progress through the lettered streets of Northeast Washington and Southeast Washington, stopping at where J Street should be. There is no North or South J Street. Revelation by omission. Our next clue is a relic found in the Burgundy region of France in a temple owned by the Knights Templar. This relic is a lid from a coffer, another name for a strong box. On the coffer's lid is a carved moon, a sun, a pentagram, and a heptad, a seven-pointed star, or what could be called a heptagon. This coffer lid is the clue to the city this treasure is hidden, the city of Washington, D.C. The moon, the moon, the sun, the sun, the pentagram, the pentagram, and the heptagon, the heptagon, and the treasure, the head of John the Baptist, which gives the city of Washington spiritual power to draw from. Section 11, Cemeteries. The amalgamation of symbols in our nation's capital creates a talisman of protection, a protective amulet, as well as a means by which human energies from the living and the dead are harnessed. This harnessing of energies acts as a chariot for our sorcerers in Washington, which gives them the ability to have direct experience and communication with great spiritual beings. There are two ways by which this harnessing of human energies occurs in our nation's capital. Living energies are harnessed from the National Mall during demonstrations, such as the anti-war demonstrations of the 60s, and as we just saw, from the presidential inauguration on the Mall in January of 2009. Spiritual energies are harnessed by the sorcerers in Washington from the cemeteries, Arlington National Cemetery, Congressional Cemetery, and Fort Lincoln Cemetery in Maryland. In Congressional Cemetery, spiritual energies are harnessed by the 166 cenotaphs. Cenotaphs is a Greek word meaning empty tomb, a monument to the dead whose remains may be buried elsewhere. In ancient Egypt, cenotaphs were ritualistic and ceremonial in nature. A cenotaph represents the handle end of a sword with a blade stuck into the ground collecting energies. These 166 cenotaphs act similar to what voodoo priests called a canary, a clay jar used in collecting the astral soul of a person for the empowerment of the voodoo priest. The cenotaphs were designed by the architect of the U.S. Capitol, Benjamin Latrobe. At Fort Lincoln Cemetery, the harnessing of spiritual energies occurs from the mausoleum in the cemetery, evidenced by the stained glass window showing a soul being harnessed. In the back of the mausoleum, seen from a small courtyard, is the goddess from Isaiah chapter 47 verses 8 through 9, the goddess to whom the souls are being harnessed to. Fort Lincoln Cemetery is connected to the White House via the straight segment of New York Avenue. Spiritual energies are being harnessed at Arlington National Cemetery from the JFK grave and from the Lincoln Memorial on the National Mall. The assassinated presidents are linked in death by the Arlington Memorial Bridge, and both assassinated presidents were linked in life by the law of similars. Lincoln had a secretary named Kennedy. 
Kennedy had a secretary named Lincoln. Lincoln was shot in Ford's theater. Kennedy was shot in a Ford Lincoln. Lincoln's vice president was Andrew Johnson. Kennedy's vice president was Lyndon Johnson. Andrew Johnson was born in 1808. Lyndon Johnson was born in 1908. Both assassins were later killed, and both assassinated presidents were shot in the head on a Friday while seated next to their wives. The assassinated presidents are linked to Washington Circle via 23rd Street and the Arlington Memorial Bridge. And Washington Circle is the eye of the golden rectangle we saw in Section 7. Washington Circle is the point from which the logarithmic spiral begins that connects the past to the future, the Lincoln assassination to the Kennedy assassination, the harnessing of life force energies. Section 12, Chi Chakras. QI, pronounced Chi, is a Chinese word for the life force energy that flows throughout the body. Chi flows through the body by pathways called meridians. Meridian pathways are rivers of energies that bring vital force to the human body. The main meridian pathway of energy in the human body is the spinal column. Along the spinal column are seven force centers or whirls of energy known as chakras. These chakras exist in the surface of the etheric body of man. These seven chakra centers along the human spine are 1. Base or root chakra 2. Sacral chakra, procreative organs 3. Navel chakra, solar plexus 4. Heart chakra 5 throat chakra, 6, brow or third eye chakra, pineal gland, and 7, crown chakra that links to pure consciousness. Animals have meridian pathways of energies such as this horse, as does planet Earth. Cities also have meridian lines of energy. The meridian line pathway of energy or spinal column in our nation's capital is 16th Street, which Meridian Hill Park resides on. This meridian pathway of energy crosses seven points which correspond to the seven chakras. These seven points along the meridian pathway of energy, 16th Street, are 1. Base or root chakra, Jefferson Memorial 2. Sacral or procreative chakra, Jefferson Pierstone 3. Solar plexus or navel chakra, zero mile marker 4. Heart chakra, White House 5. Throat Chakra, Lafayette Park 6. Brow or Third Eye Chakra, Pineal Gland, Scott Circle and 7. Crown Chakra, U and 16th Street, Chakra of Pure Consciousness which links to the world of spirit. These 7 chakra points along a meridian pathway of energy, 16th Street, are centers of activity that receives, assimilates and expresses life force energy that has an effect throughout our nation's capital and the world. In summation, what the DC street sorcerers have done is create a powerful array of images that act as directive agents for the will of the sorcerer. And these images are carriers of psychic energy that have an effect on the microcosm of Washington, DC, and the macrocosm. The world. Depending how caught up you may be in the sorcery magician spell casting that you've just seen in this DC sorcery documentary, there is something you should have seen. 
And that's something you should have seen is called design. Obviously, what you've seen is design. This man was once caught in Washington, D.C. during a traffic jam, and I remember while there thinking to myself, what kind of idiot laid out these streets? There are streets going this way and that, at this angle and that angle, coming in this way and that, and there's circle streets here and circle streets there, and there seemed to be no design or rhyme or reason to it. Well, there was, there is a design, and it was no idiot that was involved in the designer. Now, here's a truth we need to understand. Where there is a design, there is a designer. The designer, Satan. That designer is the conspirator, the conspirator of conspirators. Now, there have been many books written about conspiracy, and many of those that tell you about conspiracy make their money telling you about conspiracy, and many of them are, believe it or not, part of the conspiracy. For they work real hard to keep you from the book that tells you of the conspirator of conspirators, of the conspiracy of all conspiracies. They work hard to keep you from knowing about the conspirator and the book that tells you about the conspirator, the Bible. The very first story in the Bible after the creation story is a conspiracy story. It's a story of Satan conspiring. And in that story, we realize that Satan had a plan all along. And it's told there, that beginning of that conspiratorial plan, right there in the book, that they keep you from. Now you may say, I don't believe in that book, or I don't believe in Satan. But I say to you, that the one who escaped the grasp of death after three days and three nights in the tomb did and does, and he told you and I in John 8, 44, you are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father the devil. The designers of Washington, D.C. were doing the desires of their father the devil, the master architect, you might say and they carried out his desires and will. Again, Jesus said there were those who were of their father the devil that desired to do his works and carry out his plan and his design. Remember, where there is a design, there is a designer. Now they have worked hard to condition us and program us to feel foolish if we believe in conspiracy. In fact, the script that they give their conservative talk show hosts will include calling us conservative kooks if we were to believe in such a thing. But people think about this. If there was a conspiracy, there would be conspirators, people involved in the conspiracy. And what would be the one thing that those conspirators would want us to believe? They would want us to believe it's foolish to believe there's a conspiracy. Or let me put it this way, what is one of the things they would not want us to believe? They would not want us to believe in conspiracy. So, they would call you a conspiracy kook if you did. And so, many, afraid of some kind of title, follow the programming that's given to them. Now, there will be many that view this DC Street Sorcery documentary that do believe in conspiracy, but they don't believe in the conspiracy of conspiracies. They don't believe in the conspirator of conspirators, the devil. Don't be so foolish as to deny the designer called Satan. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, And the great serpent was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So we see in the Bible that deception, which is another word for conspiracy, is carried out by the devil and his angels. Don't be so foolish as to deny that conspiracy.
Many who do believe in conspiracy will foolishly deny that this aspect of the conspiracy exists. The Bible says of such in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. The Bible also tells of conspiracy, as we've mentioned before, that took place long ago in the land of Egypt. That is found in the book of Exodus chapter 1. We read there in Exodus chapter 1, starting with verse 8, Now a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, and I want you to notice, he said to his people, I want you people to know that not everyone are our people. They might look like it, but he said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them. And we'll stop there and just point out that there was a conspiracy story again. This time, in this conspiracy story, a minority of a certain people were able to enslave a majority of a mightier people. How did they do it? They had at their disposal magicians. We read of this in the story, this conspiratorial story, in chapter 7 of Exodus. I read, Then Pharaoh also called for the wise men and the sorcerers, and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts. The word for magician, according to Strong's Concordance, means cartoon, a horoscopist, as drawing magical lines or circles. Let me repeat, as drawing magical lines or circles. Such secret occult knowledge existed then, and that same secret occult magic knowledge exists now. Now there is knowledge that we are not to have. We read about that in Genesis chapter 2, verse 12, concerning the tree of knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which man was commanded not to touch. Now concerning the knowledge of evil and how they, and there is a they and there is an us, how they got it, we tell that at our website, dcstreetsorcery.com. It comes from an ancient book as far as the story telling how they got that knowledge, a book called the Book of Enoch. Now the Book of Enoch was once in the Bible canon. The Bible book, the Book of Jude, speaks of the Book of Enoch. In that Book of Enoch is told how they, the watchers, got the secret knowledge. But we tell that at the website, dcstreetsorcery.com. Concerning knowledge, Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And our people are, God's people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Concerning knowledge and the warfare that's being waged, there's a war right now being waged between good and evil, between Satan's kingdom called a new world order and the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when it comes to the knowledge of weaponry, if one side only has knowledge of, say, bow and arrow technology, and the other side has knowledge of gunpowder and rifles and cannons, which side do you think is going to win? The side that doesn't have that knowledge is the side that is destroyed for a lack thereof. Now concerning knowledge, we are told in the Bible in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 4, and I read, But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth, and knowledge will increase. That is in the New American Standard Translation. I think the King James says many will go to and fro. Most believe that 
as it talks about this end time phenomena of knowledge increasing and people traveling to and fro that that knowledge is technical knowledge and it's the time an age we live in where people travel to and fro can travel from one continent to another in a matter of hours and jet travel and so forth but I believe it's more than that it's an expansion of knowledge dealing with the knowledge that is in the scriptures and the going to and fro is going from the front to the back of the scriptures to get this knowledge figured out and you should have been able to figure out by now in this DC street sorcery that they have knowledge that we did not know they had and having that knowledge that they have a knowledge that they're using against us is a great knowledge in and of itself for us in this war between good and evil that is being waged. There is a they and an us, and they are against us. And if you listen to the us's speak about the thems, we're hearing people say, you know what they are going to do next? They are going to have a draft again, or they are going to force vaccinations, or they are going to raise taxes, or they are going to try to get our guns. It seems like the real people, the human people know there really is someone out there called they, and that they are against the us. They are against us. Now look what has happened to us in the last 50 years. I remember America 50 years ago as a young boy. Its borders were secure, its streets were safe, the family units were strong, there was a mother at home and a father's income was such that he himself could own his own home, raise a family, three to six children, no problem. There were no homosexuals strutting the streets or pedophiles registering with the sex offender registration program. These things have been now accepted as being politically correct. There were, at that time, hardly any divorces. We were the healthiest, wealthiest, strongest nation on the face of this earth. Borders completely secure. What has happened to us in a short period of time? One of the worst things that have happened to us in the short period of time has to do with the psyche the mindset. It's like there's some kind of stronghold over the people and they, the people, now accept these things as politically correct. In fact, some would condemn the speakers such as you're hearing for even bringing them up and reminding the people that they're going on. Something has happened in the mind of the people and have the people noticed? Have they noticed that there is a crowd out there called the church crowd? This despicably pusillanimous weak Judeo-Christian church crowd that doesn't seem to care? Has anyone noticed that we have more sin and corruption and crime in this land than we've ever had before and at the same time we have more churches than we've ever had before? Do you think there's a coalition? And the point I'm trying to get across is it's like no one seems to care. I think of this scripture that we've already referred to in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 10. It says, render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Now there is going to be a healing of this land because there have been so many that have been praying that special prayer posted at that unique website called GodSaveAmericaAgain.com. The prayer of 2 Chronicles 7, 14, that has to do with the people turning from their wicked ways, praying out to their God, and confessing their sins and calling for him to heal their land. The point, though, the hearts have been rendered insensitive. It's like the crowd is out there insensitive to all these things that are happening to them. How can this be? Now that you've seen the documentary, D.C. Street Sorcery, you know how. Through magic, magicians, spell casting. 
the drawing the lines in circles. Remember, that's the definition. That sorcery phenomena is what accounts for what has been talked about over the last several decades in these last 50 years by people. It, they talk about the Beltway Fever. As I said, I've been to D.C. In fact, one time I took a missionary group up and down the halls of Congress back in the 80s. I figured there was no better place to take missionaries than back to the capital of D.C. But there's a beltway that goes around Washington, D.C. And over the years, people have talked about beltway fever. It's like they have a representative that's a good, clean-cut young man that they send from home, be it South Dakota or Montana or Colorado, wherever. And as soon as he gets to D.C., it's like something comes over him. They call it Beltway Fever. No, it's not Beltway Fever. It's D.C. Street Sorcery. It's the casting of spells and sorcery. Now, you might say, I don't believe in these things, but the Bible says... These things are so. Here are some Bible passages that tell you so. Revelation 18.23, Psalms 58.5, Isaiah 47.9 and 12, Deuteronomy 18.11. Let's go to that last passage, Deuteronomy 18.11. Actually, I think we'll start in Deuteronomy 18, verse 10. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. That would seem to fit abortion. One who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritualist, or one who calls up the dead. And so the Bible tells us that such things are so, and we are not to have such in our land. And our land has become such because such things are real. Now you might say, I don't believe the Bible, I don't care what it says, but I want to say to you, and you might not know this, did you know that both houses of Congress back in the early 80s passed a law. It's called Public Law 97-280. You can read that law at the website dcsorcery.com. But that law states that the Bible is the Word of God and that it is the rock on which this republic rests and that the people of this land are to study and follow its teachings. And it certainly teaches us that such things as spell casting and sorcery and magic exists. And I want you to know that I know there will be some that view this DC Street Sorcery documentary that are involved in such stuff. You might call yourself Wiccas or you might call yourself whatever, but I tell you, because I have a responsibility according to Ezekiel chapter 3, I warn you that you either cease and stop, desist, or else. It's called repent or perish. Because the prophecies here say that this all will be taken out of the land. And it will, particularly will when we have that remnant that follow the last section of this DC documentary that has to do with taking action, the crushing of Satan. So you need to make a decision and come over on the winning side, which is the side of Jesus Christ. And he gives you that opportunity to do so. Not to do so is to perish. Now, as I said, there will be those that say, I don't believe. I don't believe in these things, sorcery and spell casting. And one of the reasons you don't is because... We, the us, have been programmed by they, the them, by their many hours of television programming and movie viewing to believe that that is all fiction, science fiction. It only happens in the movies. And thus, when you're presented with the fact that it really is happening, you can't believe it because, well, that's fiction, that's fairy tale, it only happens in the movies. And think about this, how many movies, it seems to be that there's a 
spiritual law of warfare and weaponry that the other side follows that they have to tell. But think of how many times they have told us in the movies. Now remember, Steven Spielberg, who is one of they, once was quoted as saying, film is the greatest weapon on earth. No one seemed to ask him who he's using that weapon against, but be that as it may, think of how many movies, Spielberg movies and others, have had this theme of alien type people. They look like they're normal people, but they begin to take over. And they take over the schools, the police forces, the government, the minds of the people. But there's then in that theme always a small remnant of resistors that realize what's going on and they haven't been taken in by this stronghold grasp over the people's minds and they find the master source. It might be the main mothership, it might be the, the master monster, it might be the head computer, whatever it is. But this theme you'll find in so many different movies. No, it doesn't just happen in the movies. It happens in real life, and you just happened, if you watched all of this documentary, D.C. Street Sorcery do uh, documentary, and if you happen to go to our dcsorcery.com website, you just happened to come upon the main mother load, the mother ship, the power source, let's put it that way, where the stronghold emanates from. Back to the point previously made in this DC documentary. They have knowledge that we did not know of. We now know they have knowledge that they have been using on us. Now it's knowledge that the us's are not to have. For in that first conspiracy story, the conspirator tried to tempt with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's knowledge that we are to know exists, but we are not to know of or to use. That scripture is found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. But from the tree of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat from it you shall surely die. End quote. And so I must warn those of you that have been involved in that, you will die. However, good news Jesus Christ died for us. You don't have to die. You can die through repentance. That's part of being born again, which if you want to know how that is done, you need to go to our website, dcstreetsorcery.com. But know this, if you're dealing with that kind of knowledge, you're not to. There is another knowledge that we don't seem to know about. And it has to do with the weapons that God has given to the other side, the good guys. That is told to us in the Bible, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Weapons, in the plural, given to us for the destruction, it says, of strongholds. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds. Another translation puts it this way. I use God's mighty weapons, not those made by men, to knock down the devil's strongholds. We see then from Scripture that there is for us weaponry that is far more powerful we need to have knowledge of those weapons and have the knowledge not only about those weapons existing, but have the knowledge and understanding of how to use them. Which brings us to the next section in this documentary, DC Street Sorcery. The section which is only for a few. A few that want that knowledge and want to use it. The few that the Bible speaks of as being doers of the word and not hearers only. If you fall in that crowd, we want you to go to the last section. Now this last section is only for a few, and this whole documentary really is to funnel down for that few. Actually, we only need 300 
to take down Satan's whole system called a new world order. By the way, people are beginning to wake up to that system and they're beginning to realize that it is not something they want. Here's a poster I just happened to run across the other day that someone posted up. Caution, new world order ahead. Potential hazards include military draft, World War III, forced vaccinations, prison industrial complex, elite controlled population. In the next section, you will get the knowledge of how DC street sorcery will be stopped and it can be and it will be it's so prophesied This section of this DC Sorcery documentary is a call to action. A call to action which we'll call Crush Satan. The Bible tells us that there is a small remnant that's been called to do just that. It's a concept that very few have as they're caught up in this DC street sorcery that's in our land today, but it's a concept that is taught in the Word of God. It tells us in Romans chapter 16, verse 20. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. As already stated in this documentary, DC Street Sorcery, it's the first story after the creation story. is a story of conspiracy. It's a story of the conspirator of all conspirators, Satan himself. He was conspiring then and he's conspiring now. This truth you can take or leave. Most will leave it, but this section is only for the few. Frankly, we only need 300 for the few that will take it and do something with it. It's the remnant, the remnant that see it can be done and want to do it, the crushing of Satan, and they want to be equipped with the weaponry to do it with and taught how to use that weaponry and thus we have this section. It's just for them. Now, you might be, not be called to be part of them, and don't worry about it. You can help them. The, I understand that in real warfare, for each soldier at the front lines, you need 10 in the back line to support them. And one of the ways that you can support the front line that's being called to do this Gideon stomping, so to speak, in a Gideon story that you'll learn about here in a minute, one of the ways you can support them is to pray for them. And go to that website, GodSaveAmericaAgain.com, and pray that prayer. This documentary is already a result of that prayer being prayed by hundreds of thousands across this land right now. So you might be called just to be a support troop, but this section is for that group, the Gideon elite, you might say, the remnant the prophesied remnant that have been called to crush Satan. You will get the weaponry and the training of how to use those spiritual weapons to destroy the bales, crush Satan, and cause the sorcery spell to cease in this land. The first thing the remnant needs to know is that it's the will of God that Satan be crushed Yea, be crushed by a people. We read people in the Bible these words, the will of God. It tells us in 1 John 3, 8, The Son of God appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the work of the devil. End quote. The Bible further tells us that he gave us weaponry to use in destroying the work of the devil. Now, what you've already seen in this documentary is the work, the design of that conspirator, the devil. So how can it be destroyed? It can be destroyed with the weapons that God has given the good guy side, you might say. Those that want the kingdom of Jesus Christ upon this earth, and Isaiah does say that gov the government shall be upon his, Jesus Christ's shoulders, whether you like it or not, there will be a one world government, but it won't be theirs. It will be his. 
the commander in chief, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. And there is a small remnant out there that follow him, a mighty band of believers. And believe the scriptures, it's going to be. Belief is part of this whole thing, as is faith. And we'll get into that as we go along. But let's go to the scripture that teaches that we have the weaponry to destroy their strongholds. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we go two verses, or two translations. The first one, the New American Standard. It says, we read, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. The King James translation says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds. Concerning the remnant that's going to be using that weaponry, I want to go to a prophecy in Isaiah chapter 10, starting with verse, I believe verse 20. And we're going to elaborate a little bit on this prophecy. It says, Now it will come about in that day that the remnant of Israel and those of the house of Jacob who have escaped will never again rely on the one who struck them, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Now notice in this prophecy that there is a remnant. There is a remnant that has escaped. And I think that is talking about those that have in one degree or another escaped this sorcery spell that has grasped the minds of so many people. The masses of people actually rely upon the one who strikes them. Let's read it again. Now, there will come about in that day the remnant of Israel and those who, of the house of Jacob who have escaped and will never again rely on the one who struck them, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Remember I told you about, I told you about an America 50 years ago that had its own factories, its borders were secure, its families were strong, its dollar was backed with silver, it was the mightiest, healthiest, most powerful nation, self-sufficient it was on the face of this earth. But in that short period of time, a jubilee time, 50 years, that Congress that we see operating in Washington, D.C., in this DC sorcery documentary has helped strike all that down. Now, who do the masses of the people turn to to help them in the predicament that the very ones that brought it to them have caused? They, in other words, they are looking to the ones that struck them to begin with, but not the remnant, according to this passage. Now, going back to the prophecy, we read on, in verse 21, a remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, may be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant within them will return. A destruction is determined, overflowing with righteousness. I want to emphasize that. I want you to know. I want you sons of hell to know, but I want those of you that have become too full more sons of hell. You've thrown in on the other side. You can get out. I want you to know it is prophesied a destruction is coming. So my hands are clean. I've warned you. Not I only. I have read Isaiah who has warned us. Be forewarned a destruction is coming. Let's read it again. For though your people, O Israel, be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant within them will return. A destruction is determined, overflowing with righteousness. For a complete destruction, one that is decreed, the Lord God of hosts will execute it in the midst of the whole land. There is more Bible prophecy I want to read here in Isaiah chapter 10, but it just occurred to me to put in here at this point in the documentary a concept that we need to put in the minds of our own minds and the mind of the people out there. We must be out of our minds to leave our representatives, when I say we, the different states and the state of the union here, to leave our representatives in Washington, D.C. 
With the technology that we have today, there is no reason that our representatives, senators and congressmen, have to be up there in Washington, D.C. I think the Constitution says they only need to assemble 30 days out of the year. But with the technology we have, the internet and the satellite technology, they could all be kept home near their constituency, away from the greedy grasp of the lobbyists, away from that influence in the Beltway sorcery that we see in this D.C. documentary, and they could be kept at home. How many times have we seen good congressmen sent to Washington, D.C., and all of a sudden they're not so good anymore? But if they were kept home, where they were kept close to their constituents and away from one another with the technology we got, it could be taken care of. That's just a thought I wanted to put out because maybe somebody will get their congressman to introduce a bill that says, hey, everyone operates as congressman in their own state now. Now let's go back to the prophecy. We left off in Isaiah 10, and I believe we left off with verse 23. It says again, For a complete destruction, one that is decreed, the Lord God of hosts will execute in the midst of the whole land. Verse 24. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, O my people who dwell in Zion, do not fear the Assyrian who strikes you with the rod and lifts up his staff against you the way Egypt did. I want to stop there and point out to you that, well, there's three things I want to point out to you right now. First of all, we are not to fear. We'll talk more about why that's so very important. We are not to fear the Assyrian. Now, we'll talk about this Assyrian creature here in a moment, but we notice that, according to this passage, that it was the Assyrian. I read it again. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, do not fear the Assyrian who strikes you with the rod and lifts up his staff against you the way Egypt did. Now, remember the remnant no longer rely upon the one who struck them. The ones that have been striking us have been the ones up there in that area called D.C. who are the Assyrians. And they have been striking us and striking down this once great nation. And the spell has been that those being struck are now turning to them to help them out. But I want you to see that there are two Bible stories in this prophecy of Isaiah 10:24. One has to do with the coming out of Egypt, that was the Egyptian captivity, and the other one has to do with the slaughter of Midian at the Rock of Oreb. That is the Gideon story. We'll tell you more about that because it has to do with the pulling down of strongholds that the remnant, that the remnant are going to do. Let's talk about this Assyrian creature. He's a different breed of cat, you might say, and today he's a fat cat. He's gotten richer and richer while the people have gotten poorer and poorer. He is addressed in the scriptures. Now notice it was not, according to the scripture, the Egyptians who struck them. It was the Assyrian. And the scripture says there arose a pharaoh that did not know Joseph. And that Pharaoh, as I've already pointed out, talked about our people. They were people, I want you to tell you something, they were a different people. If you go to our website, dcstorcery.com, there will be a treatise there about those that are not a people. Now, believe it or not, the Bible talks about those that are not a people. And I don't have time to talk about it here, but for those that want to take their time more time to learn about these things, that's what we've got for you, dcsorcery.com website. But suffice it to say about the Assyrian, that the Assyrian was the one, not the Egyptian, that struck them. And Egyptian history shows us that another people moved in there, in that area. Let's go to a, another prophecy. It's found in Isaiah 52, verse 1 and 2. Awake, awake, clothe yourself in your strength, O Zion. Clothe yourself in your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. 
For the uncircumcised, the unclean, will no more come unto you. Shake yourself from the dust. Rise up, O captive Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the chains around your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, You were sold for nothing, and you will be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, My people went down at the first into Egypt to reside there. Then the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Notice people from this prophecy, it was the Assyrian who oppressed them without cause. Who is this Assyrian? By the way, you might note in the prophecy that we just read that there will be an awakening. Awake, awake. And what did they awake to? They awoke to the reality that there, that there was a captivity and they were in it. They had chains around their neck that they needed to remove. They awoke to the reality, according to scriptures, that there were the unclean and uncircumcised in their midst. How many times have we seen in their movies that suddenly, when the spell's broken, the reptilian creatures are seen? It's not just in the movies, believe me. But I need to get back to this Assyrian creature. If we go back to Isaiah chapter 10, we find that it's this, I, this creature in Isaiah the Assyrian creature that actually is doing the conquest of the world. We read in Isaiah 10, starting with verse 5, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I sent it against a godless nation, and commissioned it against the people of my fury, to capture booty and to seize plunder, and to trample them down like mud in the streets. We'll pause there a moment. I just read Isaiah 10, 5 and 6. And I want you to know, America, that these creatures have done their job because the sovereign God has seen to it that they have struck us, a godless nation. I read on, though, about the creature in verse 12. So it will be that when the Lord has completed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the pomp of his haughtiness. For he has said, By the power of my hand and by my wisdom I did this, for I have understanding. I removed the boundaries of the peoples and plundered their treasures. And like a mighty man, I brought down their inhabitants. And my hand reached into the riches of the people like a nest. And as one gathers abandoned eggs, I gathered all the earth. And there was no one that flapped its wings or opened its beak or chirped. And so we see the conspiracy. One worldwide conspiracy. Removing the boundaries and taking it all in. Who was doing it? That creature. It's a prophetic term, the Assyrian. I hope this is making sense. We're dealing with prophecy, and most people cannot make sense of prophecy because they have, they have the wrong people in mind when it comes to prophecy. If you go to the website, GodSaveAmericaAgain.com, you'll find who the true people of prophecy are. The churches have misled people as to who the people of prophecy are, but... We don't have time to go into that. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 10, though, and read on. We're going to read on in verse 25 of Isaiah 10. For in a very little while my indignation against you will be spent, and my anger will be directed to their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will arouse a scourge against him like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb, and his staff will be over the sea, and he will lift it up the way he did in Egypt. Now, we have two Bible stories told there. You know, one time, it was Horace Greeley in the 1800s, told a group, he said, It is impossible to enslave mentally or physically a Bible-reading people. Today, we have a people that know all kinds of sports trivia and Hollywood trivia, but they know nothing about the Bible. But I want you to know that this last passage that I just read to you in Isaiah 10, 26, 
The Lord of hosts will arouse a scourge against him like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. That is the story of Gideon. It goes on to say, And his staff will be over the sea, and he will lift it up the way he did in Egypt. That is the story of deliverance from Egyptian captivity. But the point is, there are two Bible stories here. Most do not know about either one of them. The Egyptian story, we are told, will be replayed. There is a prophecy concerning that. I want to read that to you. It's found in Micah 7, starting with verse 15. As in the days when you came out from the land of Egypt, I will show you miracles. Nations will see and be ashamed of all their might. They will put their hand on their mouth. Their ears will be deaf. They will lick the dust like a serpent, like reptiles of the earth. They will come trembling out of their fortresses. To the Lord our God they will come in dread, and they will be afraid before thee. We'll stop there, but notice there that we are told that the miracles that were seen in Egypt will be seen again. Remember, there were miracles performed by the magicians, Pharaoh's magicians in Egypt, but the miraculous, far superior miracle power of Moses and Aaron and their staff overcame their power. The point is, you're going to see in this point, uh, this part of the documentary is our power is much greater than theirs. And I hope you saw the point in this passage I read to you that they are going to come out of their underground fortresses. That's a whole other story that we may post sometime at the website dcstreetsorcery.com. They have their own underground cities, not only across this continent, but in other places. And I say to you, you serpents, you sons of hell, you will come slithering out just as the reptiles you are. And some of you might say, well, that's, that's not a very nice Christian thing to say. That's one of the problems we have with Judeo-Christianity is nicety. If you look up the word nice, find the origin and meaning of it, it means stupid. I don't want to get off point here or start preaching here, but I tell you, it's pretty stupid of us not to believe what Jesus taught, that there are serpents. He pointed to those that had two legs and a head and arms and looked like people, and he said, you brood of vipers, you serpents, he and John the Baptist both. But that is a prophecy in Micah 7 that that story of Egypt's going to happen again. It talks about in Isaiah, and I want to read it again, Isaiah 10 Verse 25, And the Lord of hosts will rouse a scourge against him like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. Now that is talking about the Gideon story, and we need to talk a little bit about that. In that Gideon story, we're going to read about it in a minute, there was a stronghold that was pulled down. Again, I want to emphasize now, instead of the magicians of Egypt in that Egyptian story of captivity, I want to center in on the story of Gideon. Now, you read about that story in Judges chapter 6. That's where it begins. And it's the same story. We have a repeat of it in the last 50 years in America. It's a story of happy days are here again. Oh, happy days are here again. Like America started singing in the 50s. And then they forgot their God. And then what happened? They did evil in the sight of the Lord, as it says, in Judges chapter 6, verse 1, and suddenly their borders were overrun, and suddenly they found themselves in captivity, and in that story there was a stronghold, and they were being struck, and they were being struck by this stronghold. And by the way, those that are striking us, these creatures, the Assyrian, as the prophetic term is used about them, they have a way of telling you the truth, so you believe it's a lie. Jesus said in John 8, 44, of a people, you are of your father the devil. That's what he said. And he went on to say that they do the desires of their father. And the Bible says that he is a liar from the beginning, and those children have a way of lying to make you believe it's the truth, and a way of telling the truth so as to make you believe a lie. And get this. They have a way of stealing from you and make you think they're giving you something. 
And so I want you to know that what is in the going on right now of the bailout to save the ship estate is really to bring more water in to, sh to sink her. As I said, that story of Gideon begins in the book of Judges, Judges chapter 6, and that story, we see one of the first things in that story in Judges chapter 6, starting with about verse 25 and 26, these words. Now the same night it came about that the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and a second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal, which belongs to your father, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold in an orderly manner. And take a second bull and offer a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah which you shall cut down. Did you note the words stronghold? The Midianites who were in control and had conquered the Israelites had a Baal. And God knew if he was going to use this small Gideon remnant that became just 300, those that were afraid had to leave the crowd. They started out, I think, with, with uh, 10,000. You might go to our website, dcstreetsorcery.com, and listen to a series of sermons called Ask Gideon. But anyway, Gideon's force was whittled down to 300, but the first thing that Gideon had to do was to pull down the veil. Why? Because it was a stronghold. And that's what we're talking about in this D.C. street sorcery. It has to first be pulled down. It, we have a stronghold in this land over the minds of the people, and we have found that stronghold in this documentary, D.C. Street Sorcery. Now remember, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, we have weapons powerful for the pulling down of strongholds. Note the word strongholds. They have more than one. Now we've showed the major one, the D.C. Street Sorcery, but another one that merits mentioning is Hollywood. Once Steven Spielberg was quoted as saying, film is the greatest weapon on earth. How many times have we seen in their films? Now one of the reasons it's a weapon is because they put in our mind that this is just science fiction, not real. Well, let me tell you, it really is. And how many times have we really seen this theme played out time after time? As I've already mentioned, the evil aliens take over. And the next thing you know, even the minds of the people change. And there's a small group of resistors that find the mothership, so to speak, or the master monster, or the head computer, and they recognize they've got to take out that power source that has a strong hold over their society. This theme has been seen in so many movies. Here are some I just listed, and you can probably think of a whole lot more, and we'll probably have more listed on our website in the future, dcsorcery.com, but here are some of them. Star Wars, Independence Day, Lord of the Rings, They Live, Falcovy, Aliens, Matrix, I, Robot. So how does the remnant today destroy, pull down the bale of our day, that stronghold power that's emanating out of Washington, D.C., for example? How do we do it? I want you to think of a power pull. Picture in your mind, and we'll picture it on the screen, a power pull that's carrying energy, carrying energy to the enemy. How can we cut down, tear down that bail power pull? Now, if Elijah was here, he could just call down fire. The Bible tells us that the prophet Elijah had that ability. But reason tells us that God can take that power pull down with ice. He doesn't have to have fire. He could take it down with wind or an earthquake. But there is another way to take out the power pull so that it's no longer a power pull. Bear with me. Simply cut off the power. Once the power is cut off, it's no longer a power pull. It's just a pull. You know, it's like this lamp. 
this lamp was made by my son and it's a lamp that illuminates but if I reach over and shut off the light it's no longer an illuminating lamp could it really be that simple you will find that it's not the complexity of the solution that turns us away from solving the problem it's the simplicity and we can simply cut off the power and when we do that bale is no longer an emanating stronghold in one respect there is nothing now that can stop them them and their daddy the devil and their new world order their new world order of military draft and world war three and forced vaccinations and prison prison industrial complex and elite control depopulation that we talked about if you go to the website dcsorcery.com, you'll see a treatise there that talks about the fact that there is nothing that will stop the new world order. Nothing but what the Bible tells us will. In other words, there is something that will stop the new world order. But it's not going to be you conspiracy people following these people that make money telling you about the conspiracy and running you off on this track and talking about this group and that group, the only thing that will stop the New World Order is that which you must have to use the weaponry that God has given us to destroy strongholds. We go to the Bible in 1 John chapter 5. There we read verse 4 and 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Now I know there are some of you out there that are probably saying, well, I believe that Jesus was a great prophet. Well, I believe that he was like God, or God only knows what all is out there today, but you need to know this. Those that bring down the Baal believe that he's the Son of God. I want you to also notice that it is, according to this verse, we read it again in verse 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. It is those who are born of God who overcome the world. We'll stop there a moment and go back to that verse the latter part of it in a minute, but understand this, that Satan understands this. That's why he has made sure that his change agents have not only been placed in the media, not only been placed in the schools, not only been placed in the government, but have been placed into the churches, the church pulpits. The churches today are there pre predominantly, not all, but the churches there today are there predominantly to keep you from being born again. It says, those born of God overcome. That word overcome means, in the Greek, to conquer. Now, if you want to know how to be born of God, go to our website, dcstorcery.com, and there's a section there about that. I'm not, I've not got the time in this documentary to go there. I just want to take time to tell you it's those that are born of God that overcome, that word overcome means conquer, the world. Now, the world, that word world means in the Greek, it's in the Greek it's cosmos, and according to Vine's expository dictionary, it means world order. So what we see here is the only thing that will stop their world order. Those that are born of God, overcome, that is conquer, the world, the world order. I read again, 1 John 5, 4. For whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Now, I want you to know that it does say that those that overcome the world are the believers that believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But I also want you to know there is a difference between faith and belief. It's not belief, according to this passage I just read to you, that gives us the victory. It's faith 
that gives the victory. Again, we have at that website, DC Street Sorcery, a portion on there that explains to you faith and how faith works and how to work faith. But know this, there is a difference between faith and belief. Briefly here for this time in this documentary, I will say to you, faith is acting on what you believe. Acting on the Word of God. You've got to know the Word, you've got to believe the Word, and then you've got to act upon the Word. James tells us that we are to be a doer of the Word and not hearers only. That is told to us in James 1.22, quote, But prove yourselves doers of the Word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. One of the things that these Judeo-Christian churches do. Now remember, predominantly their job is to keep you from being born again. What they do is they tell you to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Believe on Jesus. Let him come into your heart. They quote John 3.16. And then they say when you're done, if you simply believe, you've been born again. The interesting thing is there's nowhere in the Bible where anyone was ever told to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior to become born again. No one was ever told to say the sinner's prayer in order to be born again. If you want to know how to be born again, you've got to do what the one who was given the keys to the kingdom said to do. That was Peter. And Peter said what to do, and we tell you that at the website dcsorcery.com under the section be born again. Now some of you will have trouble believing that there are those in these churches today that are there to keep you from the kingdom. Jesus Christ said of the serpent people in Matthew chapter 13, let's see if I can, uh, Matthew chapter 23, I want to turn there and read it to you real fast. He says in verse 13 of Matthew 23, but woe to you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites because you tr shut off the kingdom of heaven from men. Notice in that verse that they shut off the kingdom of heaven from men. How do they do that? By telling you something that's not true, but they have the ability to tell a lie to make you believe it's true. And I want you to know this truth. There is nowhere in the Bible where anyone was ever told to do the things that are being told in these churches. It's called a faith-only doctrine, but there's no faith to it. It's just simply a belief thing, no faith. Faith is acting on what we are told. We believe the word and then we act upon it. Peter told them what to do, and you go to the website and you'll be told if you go to that section called Born Again. But the Bible tells us that there are these creatures who do the very thing I'm telling you they're doing. And that's told to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me read it to you. 2 Corinthians 11, starting with verse 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their deeds. So what do we as the born again and that group of remnant that go forward, that Gideon group, what do we do in way of weaponry to pull down the strongholds? We need to know that we have access to knowledge that is far more powerful than what they have. We have weaponry that is far more powerful than what they have. We have just read that faith is the victory. We need to understand just how powerful faith is. And Jesus Christ tried to get that understanding across when he told us in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 17, I think it was, it says these words in verse 20. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you shall say to that mountain, move from here to there, and it shall move, and nothing shall be impossible to you. Faith 
It's so powerful. It's that powerful. Now, there is a faith chapter in the Bible called, I think it's, well, it's Hebrews chapter 11. We read in Hebrews chapter 11 these words in verse 32. It says, Who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises. Oh, remember that. You obtain promises by faith. Obtain promises. Shut the mouths of lions. Quench the power of fire. Escaped the edge of the sword. From weakness were made strong. Became mighty in war. Put foreign armies to flight. All this was done through this thing called faith. We have a far greater power and far greater weaponry than they. We just got to use it. We've got to go beyond the belief stage and go into the faith stage. Now, there is one thing that quenches faith. In the Bible story about Gideon, we read that those that were fearful had to leave the remnant that were moving on to conquer. And fear is the thing that quenches faith. Going back to the prophecy in Isaiah, chapter 10, verse 24, we read again, Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, do not fear the Assyrian, who strikes you with the rod and lifts up his staff against you the way Egypt did. Notice that we are not to fear the rod and the staff of the Assyrian. Now I want you to know that the rod and the staff of the Assyrian represents authority. In the story of Egypt, Moses' staff was able to swallow up the staff of the magicians. His authority and his power was greater, that's the point of that part of the story, than their staff and their rod. And so it is for us we have greater authority than they do. Now, this is something that is not taught in those Judeo-Christian churches. We have authority in Christ, and we have got to use that authority. And Jesus Christ told us we had that authority in Luke chapter 10. We want to go to Luke 10, verse 17. Quote, And the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Do you hear what he said? There is a group that has authority over all the power of the enemy. Satan and those demonic spirits are a force, a power to be reckoned with and dealt with, with authority. And when we do, we conquer them. And that's what it means for us when I say that we, the us, as we come against them, are to come against them in the authority and power of the Lord Jesus Christ, that authority and power that he has given us, those born again. It's power that will pull down their veils, shut off their power. You might say, turn off their lights. I like that old song. It dates me a little bit, I know, but... It goes like this. Turn out the lights. The party's over. And I want you to know the party, you slithering snakes, is over for you. Well, back to this point. Our weapons work by faith, and faith works in absence of fear. Now, a very major weapon in the arsenal of weapons that our God has given us for the pulling down 
destroying of strongholds is the weapon of prayer. The Bible says these words in James 5, 16 and 17. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias, that would be Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. End quote. For more on prayer, go to the website dcsorcery.com and there's a section there concerning prayer. One time the disciples came to Jesus and they said to Jesus, Jesus teaches to pray. We read about that in Luke 11. We want to read it right now. Luke 11, verse 1. And it came about while he was praying in a certain place. After he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say. Think about what he just said. When you pray, say. It's very important to understand this as we develop this weapon of prayer for this pulling down the strongholds, that you understand that the prayer needs to be said out loud. You ever heard the expression, say your prayers? Say the prayer. Don't just think it. You say it out loud. Even God when he created that which exists from nothing, spoke the word. And we need to have that prayer spoken out loud. So when you pray, say. And don't only say, but also visualize. I want to go to a passage that's famous concerning the definition of faith. It's found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Briefly, and we talk more about this at our website, dcstreetsorcery.com, concerning faith and how faith works. But briefly understand that faith is the substance. And that word substance, it entails, substance is something you can, you can touch, you can feel, you can hear, you can smell, you can taste. It, that's what it means, you, the substance of things hoped for. So when you pray, you need, to, you need to visualize, see, smell, taste, uh, hear the substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, concerning hope, one man said this, that hope does not keep a sinking ship afloat, but it simply allows you to smile while it's sinking. As our ship of state sinks, we smile because we have hope against hope. It's part of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence. Now, it's the evidence of things not seen. They, the enemy, want you to not only fear, but they always want you to look at the scene. Because if you stare or look at the scene, it seems like there's no way they could ever be, ever be overcome, ever be conquered. It would be like if the small David just would see and only saw the big, tall, heavily armed Goliath. It would be frightening. And there would be no way a small boy. And Jesus said, except we become as a child, we'll not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But there'd be no way to bring down that Goliath. But that boy, that David child, he saw Goliath laying dead with his head severed and cut off. Faith is the... I, I imagine that he not only saw it, he heard the blood gurgling, gurgling. He saw the head rolling off. He saw the giant falling. He heard the thumb. Faith is the substance. When you say... Or let me put it this way, when you pray, say, and then visualize as you say it, is one getting across. And so faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, the Bible talks about 
Well, let's talk about the evidence of things not seen. If you were to see my driver's license, you would see my my picture on that driver's license. You know that that's not me, but it's evidence that I do exist, you see. Faith is the substance of things not seen, the evidence. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence, excuse me, of things not seen. And now visualize the scene. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, we read, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The kingdom is eternal. We need to see that beyond. We need to see the rewards. We need to see that there are things temporal. We need to look at the unseen is the point that I'm trying to get across. And that's part of the weaponry. When Jesus did what he did through faith, even Jesus would see, visualize. We are told that in John 5 um, John 5, 19, Jesus therefore answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. So when we use the weapon that we're giving you, See the Father doing it, knocking over the bales, changing them into something different, cutting off the power. When you pray, say and visualize. And that prayer becomes a powerful weapon. Now, it's not the only weapon we have. There is another weapon called the anointing oil. We don't have time in this D.C. Street Sorcery documentary to tell you about it. But if you go to the website, D.C. Street sorcery.com you'll read about the uh, revealing of the secret weapon it's called the anointing oil and you'll read about the prophecy it says how it removes their yoke from us and the I want you to know this you covenant sons of AI sons of hell you serpent sons of hell and two full more sons of hell every single one of the Bales that you saw in this D.C. street sorcery has been anointed with the holy anointing oil. Let that sink in. Because I want to say something to you, sons of hell, and you A.I. covenant sons of hell. You haven't got a prayer. And you've killed the wrong only begotten son. And now you shall reap what you sow. Every one of those bales have been anointed with the holy or anointing oil, and you haven't got a prayer. We do. <laughs> oh, let's have a good laugh. You say, what are you laughing? There's more than one weapon that we have. The holy anointing oil is one. This prayer that we're giving you is one. But I want you to know laughter is a weapon as well. They have used laughter and comedy on us, and we have laughed at things. Uh, they have used their comedy quite skillfully. But I want you to know that it's quite godly to laugh. And God is laughing right now. We are told that in Psalms 2. In Psalms 2, verses 1 through 5. Why are the nations in an uproar? and the peoples devising a vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. So let's have a good laugh, shall we? Right in their serpentine faces. And let their cold-blooded reptile blood boil a little bit in fear and trembling. They haven't got a prayer. Their holy bales 
that they call holy. Unholy Baals would be better. Their Baal baloney has all been anointed with the holy anointing oil. And now we laugh with our God. Greater is he that is for us than all those that are against us. Now there is another weapon that they have been using on us. It's called music. It's called song. This DC Street Sorcery documentary is being released in the spring of calendar year 2009. And I noticed just recently there was advertised on the news of, of a music tour. And I looked it up on Wikipedia. It said, music as a weapon is an alternative metal, heavy metal, in you metal, hard rock tour created by American heavy metal band Disturbed. There have been three tours as of 2008 with a fourth tour beginning in March of 2009. The 2009 tour is being billed as a large-scale festival style event with many stands including tattoo artists, extreme sports and video games. And we also show their poster for Music is a Weapon Tour. But I want you to know that music is a weapon. And they have been using that weapon against us as well, as well as their film as a weapon. But we too have weapons mighty, more mighty than theirs, for the destroying or dis pulling down of strongholds. Song works for us as well. In fact, in the Psalms, most all of those prayers you read about in the, in the Holy Psalms are songs, prayers put to song. In weaponry, in spiritual weaponry, as in modern weaponry, you have different weapons of different size. For example, there is the dagger and the sword, or the pistol and the rifle. And we're going to use two different weapons in pulling down the bales. We're going to fire a pistol shot, a pistol prayer, I call it, and then we're going to have a rifle prayer. Remember, when you pray, you have to have faith. That's more than believing. It's taking action on what you believe. And faith is the substance. When you pray, visualize the substance. Hear it, see it, watch it crumble. Substance of things hoped for. You're not without hope. <laughs> You've got great hope. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And you might look at that big, tall, obelisk and see no way that power could be stopped. But then look at the unseen as you pray. When you pray, say, visualize. Now let's talk about prayer in song. We've talked about prayer, the prayers in the Psalms being songs. The rifle prayer we're going to sing. You'll see it in a moment. But let me take a moment and talk to you about a very, very powerful prayer concept that few people have. I call it Pray a Prophecy. In the book of Daniel, chapter 9, I believe it is, Daniel, who had been taken into the old Babylonian captivity, just as we are in a Babylonian captivity today, saw the prophecy that Jeremiah had written in his day. And that prophecy was after 70 years they were coming out. And if you take time to read there in Daniel chapter 9, you'll find that Daniel saw the prophecy, and then once he saw the prophecy, he began to pray the prophecy. Now what this does, it's great power here. Because of what Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. Imagine what he's just said. If the word abides in you, and he abides in you, ask for what, here's the thing. When you pray a prophecy, you don't have to say, oh Lord, if it be thy will. He's already revealed his will. Now you pray that will, that word that has been revealed to you, and it will be done. Here is a prophecy found in Micah chapter 5, verse 7. Then the remnant of Jacob will be among many peoples like dew from the Lord, like shower on vegetation, which do not wait for man or delay for the sons of men. 
And the remnant of Jacob will be among the nations, among many people, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among flocks of sheep, which, if he passes through, tramples down and tears, and there is none to rescue. Your hand will be lifted up against your adversaries, and all your enemies will be cut off. And it will be in that day, declares the Lord, that I will cut off your horses from among you and destroy your chariots. I will also cut off the cities of your land and tear down all your fortifications. Another word for fortification is stronghold. I will cut off sorcery from your hand. Let me repeat that. I will cut off sorcery from your hand and you will have fortune tellers no more. I will cut off your carved images and your sacred pillars from among you so that you will no longer bow down to the works of your hands. I will root out your ashram from among you and destroy your cities and I will execute vengeance in anger and wrath on the nations which have not obeyed. So there's the prophecy and we're going to pray that prophecy as we use this weapon. As we use it in faith, with authority, as we say it, as we visualize it, and as we sing it. And it will be done. We are told in Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they shall be granted you. And so when we believe, or Let's put it this way, when we're done with our prayer, we thank him for answering it. Now that's showing that we believe that it's answered. We are now developing a very powerful weapon that will do exactly what that prophecy I just read to you in Micah 5 says will be done. Then there is one last thing to do as I conclude this DC documentary. DC Street Sorcery Documentary, and, and there's more things to give, and we give a whole lot more at that website, dcsorcery.com, such as the secret weapon revealed concerning the holy anointing oil, those that are not a people, how to be born again, Baal worship in America, whores galore in America, how faith works, why put prayer to song? America the conquered. By the way, America has been conquered. Roots from Abraham to America. We give you more on the head of John the Baptist there at that website. And we interview the voice that you heard behind this DC sorcery documentary. And we interview him about that head of John the Baptist. And God save America again. Music... DVD. The last thing that I want to say in regards to this weapon is something that you may never have thought about. It's synchronicity. There is power in synchronicity. Now the concept is there in scripture. First of all, the scripture tells us of the concept of exponential power. One shall chase a thousand, two shall chase 10,000. We read of this in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 7 and 8. It says, But you will chase your enemies, and they will fall before you by the sword. Think of the sword of the Lord, which the Bible says is the word of God. And we're praying the word of God. Again, but you shall chase your enemies, and they will fall before you by the sword. By the way, concerning a sword, one time Jesus said, if you have to, sell your robe and buy a sword. Now, those were physical swords. They brought to him two, and he said, that's enough. There are some people say, oh, no, that was a spiritual sword, the sword of the Lord. No, those were physical swords. And this new world order does not want you to have weapons today. But you're going to have to obey Jesus in that area. And so our modern-day weapons of, uh, well, they brought him two. One was... Maybe one was a dagger and one was a sword. Maybe today you would say one's a pistol, one's a rifle. But anyway, I, I want you to know the weaponry we're talking about in this D.C. Street Sorcery documentary are the spiritual weapons that are mighty for the destruction or pulling down of strongholds. And I'm back on this point of synchronicity. 
I again read Leviticus 26, verse 7. You shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall before you by the sword. So, as we use the sword of the Lord, that spiritual weapon that is so powerful, know, and I'm on this point of synchronicity, that when we come together, there is an exponential power of that one chasing a thousand, two, ten thousand, but that exponential power even becomes more powerful with the concept of synchronicity. This is what I mean. I mean that we pray it out loud as we visualize it. We do it with authority, in faith, and in sync, in synchronicity. An example that comes to my mind is, I think it was called the Verance Bridge. It was in the state of Washington years ago. And this bridge had a breeze of about 35, I think it was a 40 mile an hour breeze that came across it. And the breeze was the same resonance frequency that the bridge was in. And pretty soon the bridge started uh, moving back and forth. And, and the power that began to be imparted in that bridge absolutely just broke it to pieces because this that came over it was in sync with the same resonance. A good example is light. This light from this light bulb is is incoherent light. It just spreads out. But a laser light beam is coherent. It's where all the light beams, the way I understand it, are put in focus, in sync, and they all come together and it becomes powerful. And so it is with the weaponry that we are going to use to destroy, pull down the Baal strongholds that we've seen in this DC Street Sorcery documentary. We're going to have a pistol shot fired at the top of the hour and it's a very simple prayer. And that prayer as you pray it, you visualize it, you say it with authority. We're even in the prayer thanking him for answering it. We're using his authority and the authority that he gives us. It's only about 15 seconds. But at the top of every waking hour Think to pray that prayer. Now, if you forget at the top of an hour, just somewhere in that hour, go ahead and say the prayer. But all we need is 300 people, according to the story of Gideon, to be in sync at the top of the hour from the time this is released in the spring, March of 2009, all through the rest of the calendar year, we will be in sync and we will say this prayer. This prayer is posted at our dcsorcery.com website. Lord Jesus, we pray with thy authority we say, DC sorcery cease, satanic strongholds release. Bales be broken and bound, with all idols be cast down. Stop the spells, send the spell casters to hell. Jesus cause it to be and thank you for the victory. That prayer is posted at the website, dcsorcery.com. Now, the rifle prayer. At 7 p.m. Uh, mountain time, that would be 6 Pacific, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern. We want all to not say a prayer, but sing a prayer. Now, we're going to have that song now sung. It's going to be an easy song for you to learn. The Bible tells us that we will triumph in song, and it speaks of singing. Singing a song is a new weapon. So we have put this prayer to song. And so now at the top of the hour, the 7 p.m. mountain time, it will be aired at the Scriptures for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network on satellite, on radio, on shortwave, on the internet. Go to sfawbn.com and you'll hear it at the 
7 o'clock time, mountain time. And you take time at that time to pray it yourself in song. If you go to the website, dcsorcery.com, you'll be able to click on a player there and learn the song. And so, we sing that song. As we do, we visualize what he promised he would do. We do it in authority. We do it in faith. We have an eye that sees into the unseen, and we begin to see those bales coming down. We pray the prophecy that's been given to us. The sorcery will cease. And so we conclude this D.C. Street Sorcery documentary with the song, the prayer. We hope you'll join us and do it every working day the five-day working day at 7 p.m. Mountain Time.